<laughs> Howdy ho, neighbor. <laughs> Hello, Matthew. Hey, Ryan. How's it going today? It is doing good. It's Friday, and I'm looking for the weekend. <laughs> Likewise, yes. <laughs> so uh, today we have uh, Ashiva, uh, a peer of ours, is going to be talking a little bit about uh, containers. Great. I know, and for, for those of those of you who don't know uh, what a container is and are picturing uh, large ships with containers sitting on top of it, you will uh, mm-hmm. take a... <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a take a little walk through about what that really is and kind of what that implies and um, you know some of the technology behind that and some of the choices customers have um, and hopefully do what we try to do best and that's uh, simplify things. Great, Here I'm to simplify. Yeah. Well, welcome, yeah. Shiva. Yeah, yeah, welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so I understand um, you've done some work with uh, with some of your customers. Actually, one particular customer that you've done uh, a lot of immersive work in the. Uh, you know, in the, in the container space, and, and taking what we would traditionally call, you know, I don't really want to use mono, the word monolithic in a in a bad connotation, but basically, oh, it's you know, bad. It, Come on, yeah. you know, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years ago, maybe not, but today is bad. True. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Agree, agree. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's uh, you know, definitely you know some much improved ways of architecting and deploying and building applications, particularly when it comes to the cloud, but it also is applicable on premises. Uh, so I understand you've done some stuff with uh, with one of your customers and trying to to help them through that journey and understanding what containers are and how they can apply them with some of their web based workloads. Yeah, there's a like you know uh, the on the finan- I have a financial customer that I'm working with very actively on the container space. <laughs> um, you know they're already seeing they are in the POC stage, but they're already seeing the benefits of it. And they are on a fast track to really implement on a full-blown scale. So I'm looking forward to share, you know, how guys, how those guys are doing. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and, uh, and let you walk through kind of an agenda of what you're going to be talking about and, and go from there. Okay, guys. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, about what is Kubernetes, is, you know, why there's a need for Kubernetes, how it is used, and then go through a walk through a customer use case on how it's being used at one of my customers and how they're implementing. And then uh, we'll go through a small demo on, you know, how you can actually scale up, scale down, and, you know, we can some, see some other features of Azure Kubernetes service. So let me switch to a, uh, a whiteboard here. Uh, I just draw a picture here on to really understand why we actually got to the Kubernetes stage. Uh, to do that, you know, let's go back in the time in you know, a little bit, not too far to the mainframe world. I know we still have the mainframes, but not to the 60s, 70s, you know, when we started using mainframes. Um, but uh, not too long ago, like, you know, uh, when we wanted to do, you know, do any application development, you know, be it HR application, be it Java, .NET, you know, you name it. So we always want, needed a compute source. So those we started with the physical machines. Uh, sorry, I erased that, but it's a physical machine. Okay, uh, let me get a sketch pen. I think I, that's fine. Yeah, so, but you get the point here. Um, so, those are, so we started with the physical machine. So, anything you needed, you know, you go, you go to your procurement, say, hey, I need a physical, I need a machine. Uh, we're going to develop this application. We need, you know, X number of machines. You know, we want to use them for so and so application. Then you wait for a few months, you know, those get, you know, ordered, get stacked, racked, and then you start using them. But that whole, the wait period is so long that uh, each of these projects, you know, ran forever and ever. And, um, and, and you had to build to worst case scenario. You know, if your, yes. your application had 20,000 users once or twice a year, you had to build to that. So, yeah, good. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, good point. Uh, good point, Ryan, there. So... You have all these applications that to be built. You have you are waiting from IT side on a procurement side, you know, on management side. You know, they had to create, uh, they had to create this pipeline of events, order to build to actually, you know, create the images and you know harden them according to their, you know, their financial or pharmaceutical or whatever, and then give it to you. By the time it gets to you know, developers hand, it's you know, it's definitely months away, and mm-hmm. you know, we all live through that that world. And we know how painful that is. Um, and then, you know, and recently, like, you know, about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, we moved to a more virtual world. Um, and so 
the compute sources were virtualized from the physical hardware. So we still have the OS on a physical hardware. Then we got a Hyper-V, you know, several of our competitors actually, you know, and including Microsoft, we created a Hyper-V. And then on that, you know, you can create on the fly virtualized containers or virtual machines. Uh, yeah, nobody was calling containers back then, but you know, it was virtual machines. Um, so you, the thing that I, it actually sped up, you know, speeded up or sped up from the from IT side. Hey, you know, we are giving the developers you know, in no matter of instead of months, now we cut down to in matter of days or hours. Uh, from a developer perspective, it's still a VM. You know, you could still use it, so it's good. You know, we actually progressed quite a bit. Um, but you think of how many you still have the same, you know, X number of, you know, OS images you have to manage. You have to patch them separately. You have to manage those VMs. So it's still, the, from an overhead perspective, from an operational perspective, that hasn't come down. It reduced a bit, but it hasn't really come down. We took the element of physicality out of it. <clears throat> yes. But still, the element of management and, and what I talked earlier about uh, building to your worst case scenario, you, you still have to take that into consideration. You could turn things that maybe you weren't using on and off, but uh, or off rather, but um, but you still had to have infrastructure available to support those worst case scenarios. So, okay, yep. So so I think and and that extends into the cloud. You know where yeah. customers can run those in the cloud. So so how does how does that differ? from you know thinking about an application in in you know how you helped a customer and kind of you know move move to um, you know a state where they can make more effective use of those virtual machines that they actually deployed yeah so they were actually mostly like in this space physical and virtual machine space mm -hmm. I have another slide where I'll go more detail uh, but they are actually mostly a half and half kind of a mix and mash up you know physical and virtual machine space okay um, but uh, they, so then, you know, came in the you know, container world. Um, just to understand between the virtual machine world and the container world is, yeah, you ha here you have single OS. So you are, then on top of it, you have these boundaries, you know, for each application called containers. So you have the application and also your runtime environment with that. So if I'm a, um, if I'm a .NET, if I'm a Java, you know, let's say Java 1.0, Java 7, with the, you know, that skill set, I can be you know, writing a Java 7 here. I could be writing a Java 7, Java 8, and Scala, a functional programming here. I could be writing a you know, .NET. So all of those could be, you know, can sit along on, on the same machine, same physical machine, and be, you know, and be happily work with each other. So without any issues. So, so I think... Yeah, One of the things that I struggle with, <clears throat> just personally, in a lot of this space, is I'm a server guy, right? I understand that I have to install the Java environment, I have to install the binaries, I have to set the service accounts, I have to make that OS and real, uh, runtime engine integration work properly. And this, I think, is where a lot of my customers, even myself again, don't quite grasp the concept of a container, a pure isolation boundary around an app that is extracted away from the operating system. So mm -hmm. it'd be great yeah. if you could also help us just kind of boil it down and just say, you know, help us understand how that works. Because, you know, it took year, it took a little while for people to understand, like, I can run multiple OS instances in virtual machines because there's an abstraction layer, right? There's virtual drivers that let us access the hardware through a hypervisor management plane, right? So is that similar here in containers where the application is is doing something with the OS at this at this level? Yeah, and, and one, one thing to, to add to that, Matthew, that, that if you have uh, maybe a, you know, .NET, uh, well, let's just use Java as an example, you know, uh, you know an, an older generation Java application, I'm making use of some of the, the newer components of, you know, Java 7, 8, um, th that if you have the, maybe the newer version installed on a, on a VM, your application might have some unpredictable behavior. Oh yeah, no, right. It, yeah, totally. Yeah. When we were installing multiple versions of something, it was like, it's a, okay, it's a, yeah. <laughs> it's a chaotic, right? Yeah. Oh so yeah, from, yeah. Yeah. So from here, yeah, the, what a good point, Matthew. So from an OS perspective, like as a Unix admin or you know, or a, or a Windows admin, you do not need to install the you know, the Windows the the Java version they need, because mm -hmm. based on the need, you actually would create a what called the you know those container those images. Now it could be you know Java eight, Java seven. You actually push to a, uh, you'll actually push them to a, a, a container registry, mm -hmm. and then based on what they need, they will actually pull those. You know, they will actually build the image based on that. So let's say if I'm actually creating a Java 8, 
I actually create a Java 8 image on top of that I'll actually have my app image and that's it. Those, that will be my runtime environment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, yes. so I could test it in Java 7 on my developer machine, move it through the test QA staging environments, and when it gets moved to production, it's been tested that it will work as a single entity and uh, I don't have to yeah. worry about the other uh, applications that might be running in that physical machine that might be using a newer version of Java because my 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 application is totally isolated in that in that sandbox. Now, see, I think right. that's an, another good point that you bring up is the whole aspect of it worked on my machine. Why does exactly. it work inside yeah. this yes. environment, right? Exactly. So yeah, now we're are, truly getting apples and apples for the binary aspects and the configurations into the from environment to environment. So Correct. that's pretty yeah. interesting. Okay. So uh, then, so the container world is good, but then we need somebody to manage that. So that's when these these three, you know, these orchestrators come in. So they actually manage because you know, think of you know, each container, you know, you can you have a network stack, you know, you have you can actually have an IP to a container. The containers need to talk. So let's say I am a front end and you are a back end. We both need to talk, but you are you are a Node.js. I'm a you know, I'm a Dartnet or I'm a Java. We need to talk. So we need to actually, you know, surface a, a network address, um, and if we could be on two different machines, or we may be on the same machines. Uh, so for the whole orchestration, uh, we need, you know, somebody called, you know, an orchestrator. Those are those could be a Kubernetes, those could be a Docker Swarm, uh, it could be a DCOS, which is, you know, uh, Apache, you know, Mar Apache Mesos enterprise version. Mm -hmm. So these actually go these scale these containers horizontally on multiple machines. So you can have thousands of machines with hundreds of thousands of these containers. Those all could be seamlessly talking to each other, you know, by these orchestrators. So, so that's, actually, that's an important thing to highlight too, that the the actual underlying operating system it has this, you know, the network interface and it's got, um, you know, a, a, a particular IP address, but the actual containers themselves, there's a, a, a private network that's established across the container service and each one of these containers will in a sense be uh, be like mini VMs they're not full-blown VMs in the sense that they don't have you know a, a complete copy of the kernel and uh, you know like a traditional VM but they they do have some aspects of a VM and that they get um, you know they have their own IP address maybe or, or DNS name so they're still working inside kind of the constructs of our virtual switch, right? That's in that uh, management plane again. It was like, you know, I'm trying to help my server guys out here because, you know, we struggle with the, these these layers of things, right? right? There's always a, an abstraction layer on top of an abstraction layer right. and so forth, right? So mm -hmm. yes. if, as soon as you say network, the first thing that people are going to come out and go is, all right, where's the switch, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What happens with that and yeah. where am I getting my IP address? So, yeah. okay, I, I'm following. And then the other thing, too, is the horizontal uh, scaling is that then a um, a solution for vertical scaling right so it sounds like the because now I have a fixed maybe OS mm -hmm. and I'm going to scale containers wide and and I see a lot of durability being built here is is that scaling element horizontal more more advantageous than vertical scaling then for load yeah so yeah, absolutely yeah. So VM's going to have a fixed size. I mean, you can, right, you can right. get the five physics there, but but yeah. the uh, at least yet uh, maybe quantum computing. I don't know. It's, it might, <laughs> but, it's in my backyard. It's yeah, my next yeah, project. We'll, we'll see how that works. But but the the containers themselves have some metadata in them that describe uh, you know what the core you know memory footprint requirements are. So the the management layer, the Kubernetes, Mesos, you know, Docker Swarm um, has some understanding about what sorts of resources it's need, it, it requires so okay. it knows where you know where it can run it yeah um, okay you know, it might run right next to another instance of that application on the same physical node it might be on a different physical node so no that's okay now so that may that that's that's starting to so i've got a pool i'm making slices containers if i've got room then you know management you know is taking care of that for me yeah and uh all right cool exactly all right. yeah so that's where this, this picture is like so you have, hey, you have I, a management I'm cluster. This. exactly yeah yep. Yep. so yes yeah, so you have a management cluster which purely is uh is function is to know what's your desired so okay so let me step back so when you actually have application, let's say now you actually have a front end, you have a back end. You have a front end, let's say you have a back end here. So 
maybe you know, front end is actually heavy duty. So you have, you may have thousands of visitors. You know, you, you know, maybe you're very popular. So you want more containers of the for the front end. Maybe we have few containers for back end. So in that, uh, so you actually want these to work together, though. Okay. So you you'll create something called a pod. You create a pod, and then you actually say, hey, I want five pods here. So Kubernetes will go and see, you know, how many workers it has, and it will equally distribute that based on the CPU memory and you know on those uh, CPU memory on these machines. So the you know the bigger the bigger machines will take you know, more more pods. Um, whereas so that's called a desired state configuration. So at any point, if a machine goes down, it actually automatically rebalances all the pods on those workers. So if, oh okay if, yeah so a pod is actually a unit of work where not unit of work a pod actually has a a combination of components are put together where they have to work together. So let's say this component need to send something to this component, let's say through a message bus, they actually will, put, will be put into one pod so that they will be tightly coupled. So what do I call the OS and the hardware or the virtual machine component? Is that a node? Is that a virtual machine? Yeah, I'm, I'm learning some lingo here, so what do I call that thing? Yeah, so, uh, well, the, the OS is... You can just call, I think it is still OS, but uh, you have that OS running on a pool of machines in the, on the master side and the pool of machines running on the, on the worker side. Okay, so it sounds like worker is this nomenclature for the Kubernetes. compute. Yeah, oh, okay. It's, All right, gotcha. Yeah, it's purely strictly Kubernetes, yeah. Gotcha. But the architecture is at a high level, it's a more master uh, and then worker, a uh, master and client uh, architecture. Yeah. Okay. 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 So now we have some baseline understanding of kind of what a container is, how it is an abstraction away from the virtual machine. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you work with your customer to apply an application they have to deploy in that sort of model? Yeah. So this is an interesting use case, actually. Uh, this I worked very closely which, because I loved, you know, the way they were doing things. Um, and this was a, the real practical case. So, um, this is actually uh, a lending application. So they actually have this application given to the you know, various lenders. Uh, and this is a financial institution. Financial institution, they have this lending application used by um, you know, thousands of you know, lenders across the US and you know, even the world. So the customers go to these lenders. You now they actually have the lenders take the application, the information. So they have some JSP, you know, beans. It's primarily a Java application. You know, on the SQL on the back end, um, JSP being so they take the information, they send this to the the financial client, uh, the financial institution. The financial institution takes the information. They have some ma mainframe actually running on the back end where they actually score this customer. Hey, you know, can we give a loan to this customer? You know, can we? You know, what what's the status? And what do we need to do? And then you know, give the result back to the lenders. So that's a that's a that's a business case for this one how this lending application is used, um, but uh, from a technology perspective, this is actually something written in a la you know about ten years ago, uh, and things have been added to that uh, and added to that. Now it has become such a it has become not a beast, but it has become such an application that it's very hard to manage and very flying. frequently it's kind of, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's like yeah. it's bleeding it's on the bleeding edge now so it's it's yeah. time to really repair that yeah um, so the the things i have heard from you know one of the directors there is that it's, 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 it has become so gigantic it's very hard to manage very hard to maintain um scalability issues are very frequent means like you know they have a up and down you know the holidays the peaks on uh, the weekends it's uh, the high peak so they had to manage they had to maintain that the high peak volume all the time on the server side and the server it, infrastructure side. And from a maintainability standpoint, I, I you know, had previous to Microsoft worked at a, a software vendor and I can attest to, uh, you know, their product set, you know, became more and more complex with features and to deploy that to a customer environment, um, you know, the build time took, uh, you know, to, to kind of work through the, the build process and deploy to, you know, the test environments internal to the software vendor that I worked at. Um, you know, it would take five, six hours time to actually, uh, you know, put the application through its paces and, and build it. So even if you make one change, you've got, 
you know, this minimum amount of time to actually do this to do this build, and then um, you know it was a very disruptive task to deploy a new version because you've got a number of app servers and web servers that you need to update all simultaneously because everything's so tightly coupled you can't touch one component or update one component without breaking or impacting others. Is that kind of yeah. what? What you had exactly. Here. So okay. you you just yeah you outlined many of the issues that they are they are talking, and okay. then they also have to manage a lot of you know the application moves from you know from you know it, it goes from a dev alpha beta you know test QA certification and then the production. So they have to manage this hardware up all the time. Uh, so that was a lot of waste. You know they're talking about like uh, the wastage and also the footprint they have to manage. Yeah. So that they really want to get rid of it. Uh, to, to actually scale down what is needed, what is needed minimum, and they want the capability, something they can turn it on, you know, on, you know, on demand. And then uh, they want to decouple this one because, you know, anytime they want to touch something, you know, it, it's taking months to update. You know, some of the larger features, they work up to nine months, ten months, and some of the shorter features, they work at least a month. So, uh, development is one aspect, but the integration test takes so long for them, lots of bugs, they uncover more bugs. So they have, they, they really know, you know, this needs to be rewritten. Uh, but as they are doing that, they actually want to look at, you know, how they can actually utilize the new technologies. So that's how, that's where this Kubernetes fits in. So towards, to the right, um, they actually definitely, you know, uh, changing the, the front end to Node.js. They want to totally decouple the, the front end to be more agile methodology to go into agile, agile side. So they don't want to, they want to change that as often as possible. Let's say you got a fall, they want to change the colors, you know. So they want to actually change to the, you know, to really make it, you know, beautiful. They want to really get the, the, the look and feel, you know, more and more refresh look, uh, refreshing more often. So yeah, if you're not able to do that today, that, that from a marketing <laughs> standpoint, that's uh, yeah, um, you know, that that draws attention away from your site if you're not able to keep it fresh. So that's that's definitely important, and it, and even more important for a com- for a, you know customer or a company to uh, to have you know methodology in place to be able to support that. So yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so there, yeah. So and then the the whole application they are actually doing a more a microservices framework. So they'll have okay. a uh, so the Node JS actually. So if you see the workflow, so the Node JS will actually call uh, to a main you know main component a main app, uh, which actually will do you know a call to authentication. Say hey you know this user actually has logged in from this lending site. Um, you know, and this is the request I got in, is the lender authorized to actually do the business with us. So the auth component right now actually sits in this big application. So that's actually now, it could be its own standalone component. It could actually be changed, to, you know, at its own pace, you know, as they actually change the, you know, so it could be going from OAuth to OAuth to, you know, some different authentication mechanism, different auth provider. So they decouple that. I think that's going good. Um, then they're also making some architecture changes on how they use the message queues, you know, message bus, or the shared memory, um, you know, like, uh, I think they were using some uh, some third-party messaging in the, in the current application as well, but I think that's not very really scalable, and, you know, sometimes you, you get a drop in the messages. So they want to have some more, more robust messaging platform, so each component can insert a message in the queue, and then the next component actually picks it up, you know, do this, there's some, some validation there. Uh, it actually says, hey, I'm done, put it back in the queue, and the next component picks it up. So how much of their existing code base were they able to retain? So they have a new Node.js front end. Um, yes. This, this big, you know, ball of yarn that they were supporting previously. Did, did, how, did they, how did you help them partition that up into services that could be deployed in the containers or, um, you know, or did they do that? Like, well, how, how did they, that Yeah, work? so this, so the, from the, the code, from how much they are using, it's they're using very less amount of the code. I don't know if they're using any actually, but they oh, may really? be. Okay. They may be from a, they may be using from a, like a backend, like from a scoring or from the backend, because mm-hmm. this actually afterwards, like this is something um, that they, they probably will be using this. But uh, from a, from a front end, they are totally rewriting, you know, and then, uh, some okay. of its components, they're actually totally changing because a lot of there is an old Java. They did not, it was like many, many years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the functionality features, even the objects, those are actually, some of the methods are actually are gone. You know, it's all deprecated. So, uh, and then it's all leaky as well, you know, a lot of memory leaks. So they are 
using mostly you know 7 and java 8 i think they are sticking to like java 7 but some of java 8 features um, okay. so like they had to take they had to take a step back and and unfortunately this is the case as any custom line of business application at some point there needs to be a, a kind of a decision to be made as to whether or not you continue maintaining that ball of yarn or or maybe take pieces of that and, and incorporate that into something new. So, so it sounds like it's a, it's a pretty big shift for them in this case. So how, how long did that take to go through um, So I think uh, the, the application, the Node.js, I think is going very fast. I think in, uh, in, uh, I think in a, they're going with the sprint sessions, in you know, a four-week sprint sessions. Um, I think, uh, no, one month sprint, uh, I think two weeks uh, scrum. Uh, so the daily standard, it's a lot of progress actually. I think Node.js they were able to do in eight weeks, a lot of features they were, they were able to Holy do. Cow. So that so actually yeah. speaks volume to some of the new development capabilities, but yeah. also to this deployment methodology that if they're able to take that, that application, bundle it into uh, and do an image, a container image, and deploy that into an environment, um, I'm assuming, um, and hopefully you can correct me if I'm wrong, that that this is excel. The, the using containers has allowed them to accelerate their development pipeline and and uh, and being able to kind of rapidly test that interaction between the Node.js application and all the services. Yep, um, absolutely. So okay. that's what exactly they are doing, and they are also seeing, going to some of the NoSQL in the in the operational space. But when they, when it actually goes to like in the, in the final resting piece, they are still using SQL here. Okay. But like the, in the transactional space. You know, they actually need something, you know, high throughput, you know, like edge base, high throughput, low latency, but something like a key value pair. So they're also mm -hmm. using edge base here. More, so it's pretty much latest, greatest technology. Like for state and that sort of thing. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Exactly. And then, uh, so uh, as we talked on the on the container side um, on, the, on, the, on the previous slide, so they're actually doing, with the Node.js, there again, it's not just you know it's one application, but it's a several components. You know, there are several developers working on it in their own individual pieces. So they're actually combined that into several parts, and they are pushing that into you know into different versions of uh, the components into the container registry. So as they actually develop, they image it. They have a baseline which actually has this uh, has the standards, uh, like you know you know indentation. For example, indentation, those kind of things. So they have a standard. Uh, baseline image and then from that on top of it everybody picks up and then adds the images to to that so I could be like a, if I could be page one somebody could be page two somebody could be page three like in those flows all of them will build up and they're actually pushing them to the container registry with the, the versions as they actually push so one of the benefits from again from a deployment standpoint that that brings or that lends to to the customers is that it makes it very easy to um, to do versioning on a deployed um, deployed application. When you start with a new application, very easy to deploy that initial you know code into that environment uh, to be able to to surface that application uh, to your your users. But then when you want to make changes to that application, it becomes a much more non-trivial thing. That you either have to take some downtime, or you have to have a duplicate environment that you can swap over to after you deploy your new code to it. Containers make that really simple, where you can actually tell that orchestrator that we talked about, I want to use V2, and you can actually have control over whether or not you want to turn off all of the V1s instantly and go to V2, because there might be some some reasons why you can't have a state a situation where some V1 web web apps and some V2 web apps you know, some applications support that, some might not. So you you have some control over deploying. Um, you know, leveling everything and spring up new containers, which which boot really quickly because they're not unlike VMs. You don't have to wait for the entire uh, you know entire startup time of of an operating system, um, or you can just go through and say, okay, I want to keep my application on. You know, do two at a time and and kind of go through you know all six web or web apps or or web app containers. Um, so you have there's some some control and knobs customers have to be able to deploy that makes right. that efficient. Yeah, definitely. And then, like, you know, then just talking to different developers, you know, they were actually uh, on the on the NoSQL space. They actually moved up quite a bit into te technology, how they were capturing all of that. Uh, they are now supporting a Node, you know, V1 or V2, and version one or two of Node.js. So they okay. have something called this release train. So it used to take one build used to take, you know, they used to take a weekly build, or maybe you know, twice a week or something like that. Now 
within a couple of weeks, they actually move to the release train, they call this release train, do tens of the builds in a single day. So think of like how much code, how much writing, how much actually the modernization they are doing in, within a single day. So they actually push it and if all the, the they are doing this audit, audit checks as they actually push to this release train, so if this audit checks pass at each level, boom, the build kicks in, it actually pushes to the, uh, the, the final version to the, the artifactory and mm -hmm. uh, Anybody that pulls in the from you know from there onwards, they're actually using it. So if, if, let's say if a build is done here, anybody that comes in in the, the release train, they're actually you know pulling it using a, the the latest artifactory. So the pace, the application development is picking up very fast, and they're very happy with the approach they are taking. And, yeah. So uh, you contrast that with deploying to VMs, either building new VMs, you know, very lengthy operation, or uh, uh, you know, replacing code that's already running on, you know, spread across, you know, many tens um, or in some cases hundreds, depending on the size of the application, you know, much more expedient to just deploy these these uh, kind of micro applications on, onto, you know, the collection of servers we have. So, so okay, that's, that's cool stuff. Yes, and then, uh, you know, they actually have sub-chains as well. So they have a main branch, you know, then they have a sub-chains. So Node.js people, they actually do their own builds mm -hmm. and then they actually come and merge in you know and in in the main pipeline at, at certain point again if this, the, this they have audit they have the right they have auditing they have all the documentation all within the same tool and then the same thing they're actually doing from a uh, developer perspective uh, they are using a lot of java and some of the no sequel they are using some of the open source i think i heard they were using uh, um, you know python you know those kind of things they are mm -hmm. using so so you, you think of it, Node.js, Java, Python, all different containers, but, you know, people are, you know, pushing them to container registry, doing automated builds, you know, you know that's, just, that's just a new era, you know, that, you yeah. know, five years, three years right. ago, five years ago, this would have taken many, many months to do even one build, you know, now, right. you know, several features getting added within a day, tens of builds, actually, but I think that, I think they'll, that pace will, you know, even go further, exponentially increase, uh, because, you know, they're high, they're, they're getting more, a lot more developers into into the picture. They are, you know, a lot more components will be built out um, okay. simultaneously. So they are seeing the benefit of it. So which which is good to see that in the customer. And just to summarize, in that in that bottom uh, middle quadrant, uh, you're just talking about uh, their their branching and merging strategy for allowing their developers to work simultaneously in different different releases and so forth. So you know, probably using Git or VSTS or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Okay, I just want yes. to. They, yeah, they're using clarify Git. Clarify that. Make, yeah, make sure they're that, using Git. Uh, they're using yeah. uh, uh, some third party, but they also have TFS. A lot of TFS. Okay. Uh, on prem, so they have a mix of tools. Um, I think they're also looking to use VSTS. They're also doing some VSTS POC as well. Okay. Uh, but that's a bigger conversation. Yeah. Um, and then. So, on, 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 yeah, as I say, this is uh, this is this is um, you know pretty cool that uh, that we that you know you've helped the customer. Uh, you know, move to that sort of environment. You know, I know, understand too that you have, um, you know, a really brief demo that you can walk through, highlighting some, uh, and you know, not the, obviously the customer solution, but something that that you built that kind of that sits on top of Kubernetes. Uh, yes, yeah, not the customer solution. Yeah, so I actually yeah. have built it, like a, it, I, this is actually open source. Uh, I pulled out from a gate. So mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a small voting app that actually has two components: a front end, and it's actually using a Redis cache in the back. Um, so uh, you can. Um, so I built. I built out based on these steps. I think uh, th I will share these. Uh, so the steps that I followed are um, basically, you know, you create a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, from a ma this is a path service on Azure platform. Mm -hmm. You would actually have a the master plane is you know is given you know is actually from Azure. Uh, you actually mean you know telling how many worker nodes you need actually here. Uh, so you you create a resource group. You actually name a container, um, and then I downloaded the app, but the app was not a Docker container. So I had to create a Docker image of that, um, and then I pushed that image to a a container registry. So, uh, so that's, some... that's the the store that stores your in not not uh, I don't want to use the word VHD. But I guess to create a analogous association, that's sort of what the registry is. You know, your images that 
are being started up that has your code and any other runtime components. So that's what the, the container would be. And, or the container registry rather could stores those containers. Exactly. It's uh, kind of like synonymous with a zip file. There yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah. Exactly. That, that's very yeah. nicely said, actually. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's, it. Well, that's, yeah, that's a better <laughs> yeah. association than VHD. I was trying to think of something simple. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So this this yeah. zip file basically has like this Azure work front. Actually, this is, a, this is the front end. But this is actually not the application itself. You know, this is actually built on Nginx. So if you open this up, you actually see two images. You know, the, the, the main one is the what this application, but the base image is actually the Nginx image. Um, and then, uh, you know, so this is you. So you push that to the Docker registry, the local registry I have created, um, and then um, the cube serial is the command line tool that to actually look at, you know, to to do anything to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. You use yeah, that. And I think um, the uh, the industry term for that is uh, kube cuddle. Okay, <laughs> that's what I've. Uh, that's, uh, I want to cuddle with you. <laughs> My cube wants to cuddle yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah that's. Uh, <laughs> The, the way I've uh, I've heard it referred to it, and actually, why we're on the the command line topic, um, I can tell this is all all um, you know being invoked from a Linux environment, um, and I can see from the AZ commands. Just for anybody who yeah. doesn't hasn't isn't aware of this, it, AZ is our command line tool that we have available to be able to manage Azure. Um, many different ways you can build uh, Azure container environments using the portal, using templates, using a command line, using PowerShell. Um, this is just demonstrating how to do that through the, the command line. Yeah, and, and most and we'll, of these... We'll, we'll put this in the show notes, too. So if anybody wants to walk through this, they can do it. And most of the guys I'm working on, the Unix guys, you know, they have, you know, Linux guys. So this is something that I've been working and yep. sharing with the customer. Um, so then uh, we actually, you know, we configured the Cube CTL to connect to the Azure, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster. So, you know, this is a... There are some parameters, the shell variables that we set, uh, and then we actually, uh, you know, create the, uh, we deploy our uh, our containers to our cluster, you know, which is one mm -hmm. node cluster in this case, uh, through YAML file. So this was the file which actually tells how many parts are there and all of that. Um, if you want to take a quick look at that, uh, maybe I can show here. Uh, Okay, so here I'm seeing, you know, how many replicas I want, means how many copies of that part I want. In one part, I actually have Azure Word back. That's a backend application. Uh, I'm going to use the V1, uh, V1 copy, V1 container. Uh, and here I also have, in the front, I also have one copy, one replica, one part. And then um, here I'll say, you know, maximum, um, uh, I did not have any features for like auto scaling here, but you, you can add them here. So basically, this is one. Uh, so you can see this is my container registry name, and this is the application. This is my and, container name. And there's some of the CPU, the, the resource requirements on there. So for yeah. CPU, yeah, okay. And the minimum is like this is 0.25 of the entire capacity. So if it's you know eight core, then it will be like two cores. I'm requesting. Uh, yeah. for this application. So, the, so that's important for the orchestrator to know when this thing starts getting busy and how to scale this and, and, and whether or not it has capacity to actually move this on, on a, and do another pod on the same node or on a, another node. Yep, exactly. Okay. That, yeah, that's one. Okay. So and when also when it comes up, I'm saying, you know, use these ports, but you can actually have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at least from the front port, from the front end, Ports you may want to specify because you know you, if you want to connect you need to know what port to connect. But back end you can actually have these on a on a dynamic ports as well, and you can actually have this all dynamic ports so you don't need to okay. manage. Uh, so then looking at uh, so that's that's mainly how I'm 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 actually creating my my parts. Um, to see that it actually to see my Kubernetes cluster that's already running, I'll just say you know what you know to use my watch uh, command. So it says, you know, right now, so this is actually not the IP of the machine. It's actually the IP of the container. This is mm -hmm. actually the part that's actually being, run, that's running the, the front uh, application. And then the, the, the VM hosting the pod has to then expose that somehow. So yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so so that's my IP. So that's running. So I can actually play with it. You know, it's nothing fancy about this application. Um, but uh, if... So to, to see how many, uh, to see the Kubernetes cluster, 
uh, you can actually I actually did a tunnel uh, on my put on its party client uh, it runs on 8001 node 8001 port so I just had like uh, so it's uh, it's running on 8001 port mm -hmm. and so you can actually start that you know using the command uh, uh, using on the command here aka browse aka aka so uh, we actually I, I so I actually brought up the Kubernetes console here. You can do many operations on the console, and also you can do command line. Um, so I actually purposely made this fail because I, as you have seen on the YAML file, um, I actually giving you know uh, 25 like 250 m, which is a 25 percent of CPU on the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, when I tried to go to like four machine four nodes, you know, I tried to fail because it's actually going more than it's, it's, it's going more than 100%, so it was not able to scale more than that. So it actually knows how many parts, so if you actually go crazy, hey, I want 1,000 parts on, on this machine, you will not be able to do that. Yeah. But you yeah. Okay, I got it, okay. Yeah, because I still have, I have the application up and running, so there's no impact to the application, but on the scaling side, uh, it knows it, it's not able to bring it. But if I go and actually kill one of the, one of the existing one, replica set, I will be able to, you know, it's going to bring the third machine. Uh, it's going to bring okay. another, another one. So you can do those all those operations from here. Um, you can actually change the replica here. Like, you know, I think I need to reconnect. Uh, you actually get uh, some menu here to scale from command line from from this UI here. Okay, so it kind of gives you an overview of what's, uh, you know, what what the overall health and availability is of different uh, different deployments that, or different pods you have deployed. And you know, I see here too. It shows what. IP addresses are running at and, uh, yeah. and so forth. Okay. Exactly, cool. yeah. So you can see what IPs they are running, you know, yeah. how long they have been running, are they healthy or not, what's the endpoints yeah. and all of that. Um, and I, I see labels on there too, just uh, I, that reminded me of another way I've seen customers use this where they stamp a particular pod with a, with a version and that's one of the ways that I've seen um, customers being able to, to upgrade, you know, saying take the V1 uh, you know, pods and, you know, shut them down and, you know, so many different ways I think you can use to manage, manage these environments. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then you can also change the, the number, if you want, the, maybe you want the front end to be, you know, you know, more copy, so you can actually have two parts of this running, you know, back end if it's a light, you know, mm -hmm. SQL interaction, so you can actually change. Um, so, uh, you, know, you can do all the functionality here. I'm a more a command line guy, so you know you can I, I can go you know find some commands. Um, you know I can actually scale the app like you know a, hey if I want to change this to let's see how many parts I'm running right now here. Okay. Oh, cool. So you actually have some command lines. So kubectl, you know, uh, that's the one to interact with the cluster. Okay. Uh, you can actually do auto scale. So I said in step four, you know, a five. I let me just do auto scale, so it will figure out. As the more requests from the front end come, Azure Word front would come, it actually deploys Azure Word front you know, on the remaining CPU. Uh, so you can you can let the the system decide the cube, the Kubernetes decide how many uh, instances you want. So it's auto scaling within the Kubernetes itself. Okay. Um, so there are some uh, cool things on our Azure doc, uh, Azure Docs on the Kubernetes. So it goes much more deep on a lot of these kubectl commands. Okay. Yeah, I know. There's lots of other uh, you know, podcasts and, and resources on uh, on building out uh, you know more complicated container environments. Just kind of wanted you to walk through quickly. And like I said, you know, we'll, we'll definitely put this in the show notes. Um, you know, but it sounds like uh, really cool stuff. You know, I, I think you know your customers benefiting from accelerating their time to market. Um, you know, in, in having a simpler architecture to deploy, um, and uh, you know, certainly a testament to. You know, you're, you and uh, you know any other CSAs or that you might have been working with to, to get this get this rolled out. So so thanks for walking through it today. Yep. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank yeah. you.